Come and get your love. Hello there, everybody. <laughs> love that song, man. You just got to love it. And then, of course, you know, the Guardians came along and they just uh, now it's uh, forever imprinted upon the consciousness of yet another generation. <laughs> so good to see everyone. Thank you for tuning in. I just speak favor over us all and nothing missing, nothing broken. Bosto and favor at all. Hello, Susie Q. Hey, Martin and Heidi, how you doing? No, I did not see the video. Um, interesting. If uh, Send me a link. Uh, love to uh, see it. Uh, the sun is turning the other way, that's that's big news. <laughs> that means, folks, if, if you haven't started uh, thinking about how your transition will be going, you might want to. Hey, Lost in Space, how are you doing? How are you recovering all out there? Is it getting any better? Go, go. Good to see you as well. Crystal, hello, little Evan. David, good to see you. Beloved. Sip, how you doing? Uh, Isby, what's going on, brother? David, Deborah, Sloan, good to see you. John Price, Big Al. Heading into uh, Mississippi, that's what I hear. Hello, Robert V. Favor and prosperity to you. Hello, Francis. The Soul Tribe is prospering, and I am prospering. We are all prospering together, and thank you, Poel and Ariel. Um, beautiful segue, Lucky. <laughs> like, wow, man, I just, you know, it's like passing somebody, and you didn't even have to do anything about it. Um, getting so many uh, emails, really, it's I love it. People are prospering and in some most unusual ways. Uh, anytime you're ahead more than what you were when you started out, that's prospering. Who was it that someone wrote me and said that they, in a day, and I think I'm right, in a day's period of time, something, anyway, it, it, when it all ended, they had gotten $777. And that's angels talking to you. That's all I got to say. So got some snow in the mountains. Oh, well, that's good. Great, great, brother. Glad to hear that. Uh, Emperor X, good to see you. Tam, Tam, hello. Out of bubble gum. <laughs> Puff, there we go. Hey, Nina, what you doing, dear? I think you have your show right after this one. Uh, I think it's an hour later. So make sure to tune in over there for sure. Jerry, good to see you. Um, Good to see you back. Hey, we're always here. We try to be. That's hope. Love that. Got to, Hey, David Castle, what's going on? Uh, Martin and Heidi, good to see you again. I think I said that, but I was thinking Paul from Newcastle. What's up? And I know Paul and Gaia are listening. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> good to do your personal message each morning. Good morning, Gaia. It is a fabulous day in the universe. And then although that there are those, yeah, you go, okay, sure. I'd subscribe to that. <clears throat> so what's else happening? Uh, let's see. I want to thank Jay and April over at Spiritual Raw. Uh, I did a show with them this morning. And I think they'll be posting it next week. And we're going to have them on on Tuesday. I um, had a great discussion. Yeah. You know, Satan isn't Lucifer. And when did uh, Satan get a promotion? It was a good conversation. It was, in fact, interesting how it all ties in. So uh, anyway, um, happy birthday, anniversary, if you got one. So we are prospering, folks. There is no doubt about it. I, I, I got to tell you. I like that show when it came out. It was some of the best creative writing. Uh, if you know how shows are put together, the writers make the show. And that one was anyway. Uh, let's see. The missing. Is... So anyway, Mario, I know Big Al, you're getting close to getting these done, aren't we? Because I know people are wanting to. Uh, we're going to be giving away some, and uh, Poyel, love these angels. They are cool. And I have a mannequin L added to mine. Of course, I have the uh, the uh, A-team over here and 
I'll be updating that. Uh, Poyel, again, is the angel of fortune and support. Duus, Fluins, Omnia, God sustaining everything. I love that. That's pretty cool. Um, patron of renown and celebrity, protector of positive thinkers. Got a lot of protection. Ariel, Duus, Revelator, uh, the revealing God, patron of meditation and people gifted with clairvoyance, clairsendience, and clairaudience. You know, it's like this. I got him on each shoulder, baby. And Nathaniel, I'll, I'm going to get his uh, 72 uh, angels of God, names of God poster. So, and speaking of the angel for today, you know, they appreciate it. You think there's 8 billion people in the world, and how many 8 billion out of those 8 billion are really giving recognition to another species? I mean, just because we can't see them doesn't mean they exist. I hear there's a place called London. Never actually been there. They say that there's people that live there. They say that it's been there for a long time. I've never been there, but it's real. Um, <clears throat> put that in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, this is uh, Hazel. Yeah, I'm serious. You could say Hazael, but I like Hazel. Hazael, the angel of mercy and forgiveness. Duus Merceris, the merciful God. This is the patron of people with a peaceful attitude, people closely connected to friends, lovers, altruists. I love that. People thinking positively. Hey, that's an angel you want right there with you. Um, fosters our relationships with powerful people, which will help us throughout our life. Well, this angel then definitely has been intervening on my behalf, teaches how to be free of judgment of others, focus on our actions and not on the actions of others, helps to remember the inner purity, the innocence. Weren't we just talking about that yesterday? Uh, shows how to get rid of negative thoughts. I like Hazel. Hazel. Hazel, Haziel, I think, I think Haziel is much more, I don't know, it's got a certain je ne sais quoi to it. Haziel, 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 thank you for your gifts and talents. Thank you for bringing them into my life. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see, the symbol of peace, the unconditional love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Again, altruism. Um, unselfishness and impartiality brings inner kindness and good faith in ourselves and other people, helps us respect and keep promises and commitments, fills us with honesty, trust, and, in, and sincerity, awareness, selflessness, encouragement, and grace, grace being favor, Bring support, protects from fraud and manipulation to obtain favors, absolving all evil. Transforms the negative energy into the positive one. Protects from the absence of love and possessiveness. Wow. Well, there you go. Cures, malevolence, hostility, hypocrisy, duplicity. Dissemination, um, falsity, jealousy, or fear of the of loving and being loved. The fear of being loved. Boy, you could do a whole thing right on that. I contend that that's probably, if it's not up in the top five, it's definitely should be in the top three of why most humans were so dysfunctional. We take the fun out of dysfunctional. Most people are afraid to be loved. You know, if you're going to be loved, it means you surrender. You open yourself up, you know? Yeah. It's a fact. Hmm. <laughs> I 
I love these shows, man. I mean, you know, you learn stuff here. You really do. All right. So, uh, hello, Linda. How you doing? So good to, you know, Linda, I did get your email. So, uh, bu- 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 Linda was telling some stories of favor, prosperity. So, I like covering subjects that, you know, border all different ways. So when you think about this issue of eternal life, we all think that we're going to live forever, although most of us don't remember our beginnings. I doubt if we're ever going to remember our endings. Um, But I guess in a sense, you do end in these bodies. So yeah, I can dig that. But then it gets into this thing about eternal life. Now, we live in this dualism. So if there's eternal life, then that would imply directly that there is eternal death. Hmm. So that is um, weird. Eternal death. What is that construct like? I mean, what is it? The first and second laws of thermodynamics that energy can neither be created nor destroyed and that energy is in a constant state of transition. Hmm. So, I guess the idea of eternal death is what? No consciousness? No memory? Who are you? Haven't got a freaking clue. Well, where do you come from? Can't tell you. Don't know. Where are you going? Don't know. Well, why are you here? Having a clue? (laughs) I mean, is that what that is? I mean... Non conscious, not consciousness, conscious. So to be non conscious is to what? I don't know. I, I can't imagine. You know, I was bound by that fear, that whole thing about, you know, the lake of fire and, you know, going to be thrown in there and then, you know, woe unto the one who, um, is it's not the first death to be afraid of, but it is the second death, the death of the spirit. I mean, it's it's great. It's great imagery. I mean, it's the play. You got to have the play. So in the play, uh, our protagonist in this one is us. <laughs> or so it would seem. So came across this document. And Martin, Heidi, I think you're going to find this one interesting. Why the dualism? Isn't that the question of all questions I am? Why the dualism? Because here's the fact. Uh, I was talking with uh, uh, April and Jay on this, on their show. You see, the God of this construct can't exist unless it has its antithesis. Because if it doesn't have an antithesis, it's got no reason for existing. Think about it. So I want to show everyone before we get into it. So we're about to get into, and we're going to take uh, some assumptions here. We're going to assume that this person actually lived. We're going to assume that there is an attributal history. We're going to assume that there is some historicality to its existence. And we're going to be talking about the cat who there's so much controversy over called Jesus. Did Jesus live? Was it just a myth? Um, If it did, And I call it it because it's not human. It's a hybrid, even by its own story. So, you know, and and, and the thing that is very interesting, if any of you have taken comparative religion studies or even studied your own, you'll find that we have this missing 18-year gap in the life and history of Jesus. And that 18 years is a mystery because there's no record of it, supposedly, at least none in the traditional sense of what is being taught today. 
So it's always fascinated me because, you know, well, what happened? The Maccabees deals with uh, a little bit of the, you know, miracle workings of this young protege uh, who was named Yahshua, if it was named anything, Joshua, uh, but later became known as Jesus. Now, there is a book. Uh, this is an academic level book, I will tell you ahead of time. But if you're one that really wants to get into these things and try to find out the history, I would really suggest this is the search, um, the historians in search for the historical Jesus. This is by Dr. Ron Charles. Um, and I'll just give you kind of the summation in his research to find out was there anyone really called this? I mean, did anyone really do this? I mean, we have no pictures, and I've talked about this, and there were artisans all around. But in any case, we're doing some assuming here. Now, what his research found out was that um, how the story goes that this protege, this, this miracle child, Jesus, uh, his parents, Mary, and Joseph. Joseph was never a carpenter. He was, in fact, um, a stonemason. There was an accident. He died. So Mary went to her uncle, Joseph of Amaria, and Joseph of Amaria was a very wealthy, wealthy. In fact, he was the richest Jew in the Roman Empire. Well, the story goes that he took in Mary, his niece, and her son and her other children. Um, it was said that this young boy showed tremendous intelligence. He then took the family and moved them to Egypt, Alexandria to be exact. It was there that the young Jesus was getting formal education in all the different religions, all the different beliefs. From there, uh, Joseph, because he owned all the, he, he supervised all the mining enterprises for the Roman Empire. And from there, he took Mary and Jesus, and apparently the siblings were, I don't know what happened to them, it's very difficult, but according to Dr. Charles here, um, was in Rome, then in Spain, and eventually up into Britannia. And from there, we know that the Druid stories say that the Christ did, in fact, visit Britannia. This kind of goes into all that. It was at this point, upon his return to prepare for his death, that the story picks up. Now, there is a, um, another story that exist, and I thought that I would bring this out because it's interesting. If this cat did live, then um, there should be more evidence of it. We have the scraps and the bits and the pieces. It's quite interesting. And like I said, Dr. Uh, Charles did a, uh, he did a, a fabulous job. I mean, it's, it's detailed. Um, some parts are somewhat laborious, but uh, hey, that's what history sometimes is. Um, so there is another document that has surfaced, and this is the document of the missing 18 years of Jesus in India. So uh, give me one second here as he pulls that down. Do, 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 do. There we go. All right. So um, this is a statement by the publisher, and this is interesting. I've been reading this. Uh, it's not a difficult read. It's a fascinating read and, and about these 18 years that they have a story of where Jesus spent in Tibet, in India, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and eventually back to Judea. So I just want to read the statement by the publisher because it's, it's well worth it. It says, in 1894, a translation of an ancient Tibetan document was published in France by the Russian adventurer and journalist Nicholas Notakovich. 
The Tibetan document was said to be the translation of the Tibetan language of a first century Pali text, which was kept in one of the monasteries in Lhasa, Tibet, and was of an account of Jesus' life as reported by merchants traveling between China and India and the Mediterranean, the Silk Road. It was an account unblemished by dogmatic orthodoxy. Obviously, the text quickly caught the public eye, and in a number of English translations was produced both in the U.S. and the U.K. within a short span of time. Non-church circles warmly welcomed the new insights of the Novandovich text, but soon church orthodoxy moved in and actively denounced the book as a falsification that came from the overactive and creative mind of a Russian adventurer. The result was after about two decades, the book receded almost back into oblivion. This situation has continued in today, except for some new age circles. Well, Sometimes old age is fine, but you know, you've got to move forward. You got to have a new age. So I guess we're in a new age circle, folks. So we would be uh, amongst this number. Welcome to the club. What is clear, however, is that the current rejection of the information as given by Novodovich does not go much further than accusing Novodovich without proper investigation or producing a pack of lies. That's how they always do it. Such critics have, however, no respect for a millennial old Indian oral tradition that confirms Jesus stayed and studied in India and in Nepal and Tibet. Isn't it odd that when they say, well, our stories are based upon the oral traditions of a well founded cultural of people? Well, they're saying the same thing. The hell you say? They're lying. They're heathens. They don't know. Yeah, you see, <laughs> fill in the love. Um, according to the oral tradition, Jesus studied in India to become a true Vedic scholar, a pandit, and a yogi by studying and practicing the tenets of yoga under Indian master. The Indian tradition also confirms that Jesus studied Buddhism in Nepal, Tibet. All in all, Jesus lived for a longer period, 18 years outside rather than in Palestine. Hmm. Well, you're going to burn in hell for that, don't you know? You can't be saying that. The topic of Jesus in India has been researched by a number of filmmakers, authors, and historians. Their collective efforts research have resulted in a confirmation of Jesus' presence in India by a number of highly respected Indian scholars, authors, and religious leaders, such as uh, Swami Habadaneda, I think, I don't know, uh, and I cannot pronounce these Indian names, Vendetta Moth, Calcutta, Swami Apandendada, actually saw the Tibetan manuscript in the same monastery that was visited by Nicholas Navatovich in 1887, in Laka, India. With the help of a Lama librarian of the Hemis Monastery, he translated a number of chapters of the manuscript and confirmed the authenticity of Novanovich's discovery. The confirmation of Swami, also of the Vinda Matha in, Cal in Calcutta, I don't even think they even call it Calcutta anymore, the explicit confirmation of Swami Niskalandra, uh, and a number of obvious historical figures in the uh, Hindu culture, and where all of them says where Jesus studied for about six years. Further confirmation of the Shari Santa Sari Baba, the confirmation of Swami, I think that is Chindata, Divine Life Society, and of his highly respected master, Swami Shin Van Anda. The confirmation, again, of another uh, Yoanganda, the author of the autobiography of yoga. Confirmation dating from the 20s and the 30s of the last century by the head lama of the Himis Monastery, where the Tibetan manuscript was kept. Confirmation by the Swami, I think that's Ramatharaya, 
who lived between 1873 and 1906. It is regarded that against the weight of oral evidence and witness accounts in India by many highly respected learned pundits and wise men, the Western tradition continues to ignore such accounts and prefers to stick with the perceived simplicity of lies, nothing but lies without conducting any further proper investigation. The, and this is interesting. So conversion productions hopes to generate by the publication of this book to generate sufficient public interest and support to conduct a further investigation into the background of Jesus's presence in India by interviewing those insiders and learned people who are willing to share their knowledge and sympathy with us. A DVD production will follow ready the publication through various medias. That's really interesting. It says, if you wish to contribute uh, if you have information, then by all means, send an email to info at conversion.nl. That's because they're located in the Netherlands. Uh, so it's, all, it's called Chapter One. And it's interesting. My studies of about India from um, Protestant Christianism was that when Paul was supposedly baptized in the Holy Spirit, that he wanted to go to India. That's where he wanted to go preach. That's where he wanted to go and start converting. It is said in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit restrained him from going into India and uh, never did. Uh, it is said that the disciple Matthew did go to India, but where he was boiled alive uh, with them stripping his skin. So that is the only references to anything about India, which is a shame because we know India existed before the Jews did. So um, this is an interesting topic because it, it falls into line because if there is some evidence of truth of this, then it means everything that we've known has been wrong. Or, or purposely altered. Now, we're an open-minded group here, and let's just see what the story has to say. It says, the Gospel of St. Issa takes the form of a biography of Jesus and of the origin of the Jewish tra tradition as it emerged from its ancient Egyptian background. The text originates from Nepal, Tibet, where it was composed in the first half of the first century AD. If that is true, this would make one of the most earliest, and if it can be authenticated, actual writings of such an individual, predating everything of the New Testament Bible by some 150 plus years. And I guess if your gig is about being coming rich, like the church is, um, they are the largest real estate owner in the world, but I digress. Um, then, yeah, this would be a real threat. You would not want this information coming out. So it says, on the basis of information reaching the Himalayan regions, for merchants traveling to and from the Mediterranean along the ancient Silk Route, connecting China and India, with the West. Isa is the Tibetan name for Jesus, and it is most probably derived from the Pali Sanskrit word Isha, meaning Lord. In Arabic, Jesus is also known as Isha. The 18 Forgotten Years. The remarkable feature of this text is that it provides a description of Jesus's life, which is quite different and sometimes even contrary to the Orthodox Church point of view. The, version, the vision of the person of Jesus is clearly untainted by church dogma as it evolved over 300 years after the crucifixion. For some time, theologians have been trying to fulfill in the information gap which existed in the biblical accounts about Jesus' whereabouts and activities between the age of 12 and 30. I just gave you one other account from a theologian historian's point of view. Um, 
that when Jesus was 12 years old, he appeared in the great temple of Jerusalem, where he impressed the Jewish scribes and priests with his great learning and understanding of the scriptures. From that moment, the gospel takes a huge leap forward and reintroduces Jesus when he was about 30 years old and starting his Palestinian mission with the baptism in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, which that's impossible, but we're not, that's, we're, again, we're making some assumptions here. So in this way, we have about 18 years, which are not accounted for by our biblical sources, only some apocryphal text of a fairly late date try to fill in the gap as it was already perceived in the second and third centuries when most of the New Testament was written. This text clearly states that Jesus went to India and the Himalayan range when he was 13 years of age for further study and inner growth in wisdom and understanding. As a 13-year-old boy, it was Jewish custom to find a bride and have a brothel. The text states that Jesus had decided that the way of a householder was not his way. His name and fame had already been established as confirmed in the Bible, where as a 12-year-old boy, he astounded the scribes and priests by his learnings and understanding of the Jewish scriptures. As the text states, Jesus was an attractive son in law for the wealthy class but that was not his way. So he left his parental home, joined a group of merchants returning to India, probably through the well-known Silk Route and its branches, and reached India the next year. He studied in India in the great centers of learning, and at the time, and moved on to Nepal, Tibet, to study Buddhism. This period took about 12 years. The next six years were spent in preaching whilst he was slowly heading back to Palestine through Afghanistan and Persia. In this way, Jesus became not only a great yogi, but also a Buddhist master. At 12, he had already acquired full learning of a well-versed rabbi. So Jesus personified three great religions in his person. It is a well-known fact that the New Testament has been greatly colored and doctored by inner development of dogmatic learning in the church during the first four centuries. The significance of this text is that it is not influenced by church dogma, just as in the case of the Gospel of Thomas as part of the Nag Hammadi Library. The manuscript of the Gospel of St. Issa was discovered in 1887 in a boostus Buddhist Hemis Monastery and Lak Ladakh, which is the province of Kashmir State, India, bordering Tibet. The original text was written in a Pali language, which is the sacred language of Buddhism and closely related to Sanskrit. The Pali text is said to be kept in one of the great monasteries in Lhasa, Tibet, but the text was translated in the Tibetan language and several copies of this text are said to be kept in some of the Buddhist monasteries in Tibet, including the Himis Monastery. The Tibetan manuscript of the Himis Monastery was shown to the Russian author, journalist, and adventurer Nicholas Novatovich, who was on his way to Tibet when he was taken into the Himis Monastery and nursed because of a broken leg. The librarian of the monastery told him of the manuscript and how St. Issa was a highly respected figure in Buddhist history. Issa is the Buddhist name for Jesus. He also mentioned that the original Pali text dates from the first part of the first century and is a eyewitness account of the events around Jesus' life in Palestine and in India. It is the oldest document and life account of Jesus available to us. The sources of information were merchants who regularly followed the silk trade route between China and India and the Roman Empire. Following in the rich tradition of, again, um, when you think about how documents are traded, documents have extreme value, particularly religious documents. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, I, I just find this so interesting because you can almost get the imagery of, of the time period. I mean, you know, Hollywood's done a good job of, you know, recreating that for our minds. Um, but anyway, ever since the conquest of Afghanistan and the Indus Delta by Alexander the Great, the Silk Route had become increasingly more safe as a trade route, and there was an active trade between the distant worlds of the East and the West. Trade would follow the traditional Silk Route to Syria and to Levant, but the sea route from Alexandria through the Red Sea and via the Arabian Sea became even more important, especially when the secrets of the monsoon winds were discovered by the Romans around the year 40 AD. Hmm. I think I recall another group of people that uh, did that trade route as well. They'll go unnamed at the moment. In his uh, introduction, Nicholas describes how he discovered the existence of this text even before he visited the monastery. He states that he came into contact with an abbot of yet another Buddhist monastery in Latka, who mentioned that in the capital city of Tibet, Lasha, a number of manuscripts were kept in the various monastic libraries, which contain extensive information about the life of Jesus and his stay in India. How interesting. On the basis of this information, Novanovich traveled, decided to travel to Lasha in order to find out for himself. By the way, it was the Phoenicians, if anyone is asking. That's what they traded in. At the time, Tibet was not open for European travelers, but even so, he decided to give this venture a try. On his way to Tibet, he passed the provincial town of La and Ladakh, which had, excuse me, been incorporated into Kashmir state since recent times. He visited the important monastery in the neighborhood of Lakh, which is situated about 1,300 feet. Th th excuse me, 13,000 feet. The air does get a little thin up there. He was cordially received by the abbot of the monastery who confirmed the information that Novanovich had already received from the first abbot. The Hemis abbot said that Jesus was known in Tibet as Saint Isa and that Jesus had studied Buddhism in Nepal and Tibet. The birthplace of the Buddha is the town of Lumbini, which is in Nepal and adjacent to Tibet. The abbot continued and said, the name Isa is very, uh, very much respected among the Buddhists, he said, but he is only known by the chief lamas who have read the scrolls relating to his life. There have existed an infinite number of Buddhas like Isa, and the 84,000 scrolls are filled brim full of details concerning each one of them. But very few persons have read the 100th part of these memoirs. In conformity with established custom, every disciple or lama who visits Lasha makes a gift of one or several copies from the skulls there to the covenant to which he belongs. Our Ganpa, among others, possesses already a great number, which I read in my leisure hours. Among them are the memoirs of the life and the acts of Buddha Isa, who preached the same doctrine in India and among the sons of Israel, and who was put to death by pagans uh, whose descendants later on adapted the beliefs he spread, and those beliefs are yours. Hmm. The great Buddha, the soul of the universe, is the incarnation of Brahma. He most always remains immobile, containing in himself all things, being in himself the origin of all, and his breath vibrating the world, excuse me, vibrate. Anyway, he has left man to the control of his own forces, okay? But at certain epochs, lays aside his inaction 
and puts on a human form that he may, as their teacher and guide, rescue his creatures from impending destruction. In the course of his terrestrial existence, in the similitude of man, Buddha creates a new world in the hearts of erring men. He leaves the earth to become once more an invisible being and resumes his condition of perfect bliss. Not blessing, bliss. 3,000 years ago, Buddha incarnated in the celebrated Prince Sakya Muni, reaffirming and propagating the doctrines taught by him in his 20 preceding incarnations. 2,500 years ago, the great soul of the world incarnated anew in, I believe that is Guttama, laying the foundation of a new world in Brima, Siam, and different islands. Soon afterwards, Buddhism began to penetrate China through the pers persevering efforts of the sages who devoted themselves to the propagation of the sacred doctrine and under Ming Tai of the Honi Dynasty, nearly 2,050 years ago, the teachings of Sakyamuni were adapted by the people of that country. Simultaneously, with the appearance of Buddhism in China, the same doctrines began to spread among the Israelites. Fascinating. It is almost 2,000 years ago that the perfect being, awakening once more for a short time from his inaction, incarnated in a newborn child of a poor family. Well, that's questionable, but okay. We're assuming here now. It was his will that this little child should enlighten unfortunate humanity of the life beyond the grave and, by his own example, bring back men to the true way and into the path that might best lead them to original moral purity. And that's a big debate, you know, we, the, of materialism. We live in a construct that is predicated, the fabric itself is materialism. And it's directly opposite of basically stripping yourself of all the material parts of this world in order to be able to adequately pass unimpeded to the other side. I don't know. When this sacred child attained a certain age, he was brought to India, where until he attained manhood, he studied the laws of the great Buddha who dwells eternally in heaven. The roles which treat the life of Isha and which were brought from India to Nepal and from Nepal to Tibet are written in the Pali language and are now at the Lasha, but we possess one copy in our own tongue, that is in the Tibetan language. Fascinating. We haven't even read it yet, but just the history alone. So Novanovich decides to publish the text. At first, the abbot was not ready to show the manuscript to Novanovich, and he invited Novanovich to return to the monastery in Himis another time, huh? when he might be shown the manuscript. This invitation was of great significance because when Novanovich had left the monastery to continue his journey, he fell from his horse and broke a leg. He was carried back to, <laughs> you can check out any time you like, you just can never leave. <laughs> um, so anyway, here he comes back to the monastery uh, where his leg is, is treated and where he had to stay for some time. So during the second visit to the monastery, he was shown the manuscript. Well, he wasn't going anywhere for at least a two, two months. Um, which was translated for him by the librarian from the Tibetan language. Novanovich made ample notes and wrote down the translation. He worked out his notes and published his book in the French language in 1894 entitled La Vere in Commune de Jesus Christ, 
The book was published by Paul Ollendorf in Paris. The French text serves as a basis for three American and one English editions with different translators. Unfortunately, it is not possible to know how many translations of translations are involved in the publication of the English text. Novanovich had a servant who came from Pondicherry uh, in South India. Pondic, what is that? Is that a Pondicherry? was at the time still French in enclave in the south coast of India, and it is probably that the servant spoke French and possibly also Urdu or Hindi, apart from the probability of the native tongue Tamil. It is impo improbable that the abbot or one of the lamas of the Hemis Monastery spoke French, Russian, or even English, but probably Urdu or Hindi. Novanovich was fully conversant with French. His published books were published in France. Uh, it may well be that he made uh, his notes in French and not in Russian. Certain is that the English translations are based on the French first editions. When Novanovich returned to Russia, he showed his notes to the Metropolitan Bishop in Kiev, the manager of the Platon. The prelate agreed with Novanovich that his discovery was of great interest, but he also warned him that publication of his book would do him more harm than good. <laughs> Off with your head, damn you. Uh, he got the same advice <laughs> from two Roman Catholic cardinals. Well, you think there's a trend here going on, folks? Could you imagine? Could you only imagine what these Roman Catholic cardinals must have been thinking as they're reading this. I mean, could you see that? Both of them, right? They're, they're sitting at the table. Are you reading this shit? Yeah. Are you believing this? Are you freaking kidding me? If we even mention this, they'll cut our heads, you see? <laughs> but Novanovich claims that one of them even confided in him that there were surely 63 books or manuscripts available in the Vatican Library on the subject of Jesus' stay and studies in India and in Tibet. Well, surprise, surprise, surprise. Hmm. You know, just call it just me, but I have learned in life that when one person only gives you one version, their version, and no other version is allowed. Run, Forrest, run! That's all I got to say. After some hesitation, Novanovich decided to proceed and publish his text. The first edition was, again, was in French and was published in 1894. In the same year, English translations followed. The books were reprinted several times, but in general, the reception of the books, especially by the organized church, was less than enthusiastic. Like, man, I'm feeling the negative vibes here. When the news had abated and the critics had done their work, the book and the text were forgotten, and the book was only known within a small circles of interested researchers. But the text was not forgotten altogether, and after some time, the valuable work of Novanovich was praised. The support came from a highly respected Swami of Rim, and I, again, I think that's Ramaskarishna, uh, Vendetta Order of Calcutta, which is the same order of the Swami that lived and worked in the U.S. for some 25 years. And when he finally returned to India in 1922, he decided to take a journey to the Himalayas and visit also the Himas Monastery, which had been visited by Novanovich 35 years earlier. In the USA, he had read a Novanovich's book on Jesus' stay in India and Tibet, and the Swami wanted to take the opportunity to find out for himself. In the 35 years between the stay of Novanovich and the Himas Monastery and Swami's visit, the abbot of the Himis, Himis Monastery had encountered quite some trouble because of the variety of investigative visitors who came to the monastery to inquire about the manuscript. Yeah, I bet they weren't expecting that. Attempts were even made to confiscate the manuscript. Hmm. This is a uh, Sherlock Holmes story. The result 
was that the monastery flatly denied the visit of Novanovich in 1887. It also stated that there was no manuscript in the library describing Jesus' stay in India and life in general. This was much to the pleasure of the visitors who could only conclude that the whole story of Novanovich was no more than a figment of his rather creative imagination. Novanovich was just another fraud. How right had Monsignor Platon of Kiev had been when he predicted that the book of Novanovich would bring him more harm than benefit. Novanovich died anonymously during the Russian Revolution, but in 1922, the noise about Novanovich's book had abated and the story had been forgotten so that the abbot could now speak freely again. Thus, it happened that the Lama, who acted as a host to the Swami and who had took him around the monastery confirmed the visit of Novanovich to which the monastery in 1887. He also confirmed that Novanovich had seen the manuscripts about Jesus, Isa, and that the text had been translated for him from the Tibetan. The Lama took the Swami to the library and showed him the manuscript. Since the Lama spoke English and he was able to translate parts of the text from the Swami, Swamajer noted that the translated parts and published them in his book about the journey to Kashmir and Tibet. This book was published in Bengali in the 30s and in English in 18, 1987 by the Ramaskashna Vendetta Matha, precisely 100 years after the visit of Novanovich to the Hemis Monastery. This book is still available. What strikes us is that the translation is given by Swami uh, Abhadananda runs parallel to the text as published by Novanovich. There are few fundamental differences, and this very fact serves as a great complement to the ingenuity and care and the precision that Novanovich took to publish a reliable text, even when the translation had not been produced through the intermediary of at least three or even four languages. After the Swami and another disciple of the Shari visited the monastery. The Swami, the, Lama, the Lamas, also confirmed to him that Naranovich had been in the monastery, and he was also shown the manuscript with the Isa text. Ten years later, Dr. Nicholas Rorich visited the monastery during his major round trip through the Himalayas, which took him and his party several years. He was also shown the manuscript, and during his round trip, he was informed, though the still living oral tradition, about the stay of Jesus, Isa, in India and in Nepal. His observations are published in two works, uh, in 1929, The Heart of Asia and the Altari Himalaya. His quotations closely follow the text as rendered by Novanovich and the Swami. In the 30s, more visits were from the West, had confirmation of the existence of the manuscript. All right. And then it shows how this ended up in uh, the Netherlands, uh, where it is housed, as I understand, the book today. And although the time is running away, um, we will get into some of this because it is um, quite interesting. And I think you're going to find it interesting as well. <laughs> I'm looking at this and I'm going, wait a minute, that don't look right. <laughs> and you know what? It doesn't look right. <laughs> uh, but hey, um, we'll get back to that. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, we go from the devil to, you know, different stories about Jesus and, um, you know, it is said, uh, I've read in some Native American ancient text that this brother from the East showed up there, which I don't know. I don't know about you, but the more I read, the more I begin to question, this sounds like an ET. Or maybe it is the awakening of an inactive consciousness. I don't know. But we're going to find out that some of the things are quite interesting that we find out later 
And I often wonder, well, who took from who? Let's see. This one is claimed to be written nearly a hundred years before any of the others. I wonder who wrote the book of love. But anyway, <laughs> um, so how's everyone in the chat room? Uh, it's a very fascinating book. It is lucky. And I just, we'll get back to it tomorrow. I just saw that they, there was no need to get into any of the, uh, there, it's an adventure. It's, it's really, it's like reading a Mark Twain book. I mean, I'm getting the idea of Huckleberry Finn here, you know, and Tom Sawyer, that type of an adventure, you know? And someone asked me, I saw it in the email and I didn't have a chance to write back. Uh, you're looking for the book, The Teachings of the Far East Masters. This was the, and if you remember that series I did getting into that, in there, they talk about this Jesus character being there, teaching them how to live for hundreds of years. What was it that one of the expeditions found? One of the individuals was over 500 years old. That's as far as that he could go back and was probably even older than that. Ah, uh, all right. So, um, hey, Lost in Space, it is a great story. But I mean, listen, they're all stories, all of them. I mean, unless you're writing your own history, someone else might write your history, but they're not writing your history. They're writing their vision. What's that up, Martin Heidi? We know the story. Yeah. But it is it is interesting. Yeah. I found it interesting. And why not? I mean, we get so much accused over here. It's like, oh man, that 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 group over there, they they read all that 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 occult stuff, man. I mean, no, we're just we're just free thinkers. We're just saying, okay, well. In order to behave, to, to formulate a proper hypothesis, you must have all, or at least all the available known facts. American Monk, I think you're right, Dave. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. See, this is what I love about this group. It's like, yeah. Yeah, and it's a good story. I mean, it's one that's, you know, we're going to continue because, hey, listen, you know, in this time and age, we need a little positivity. I mean, we give off abundance of it here, but, you know, spreading out there. And then we continue to study about the old angels, right? The old angels. Well, they don't age. Do any of us age? I don't feel aged. What is aged? I like aged Parmesan cheese. I like aged blue cheese. I like aged beef. All right, so it's all good. <laughs> all right, everyone. Uh, join Nina in about an hour over her channel. She's left there. This Nina the Mystic. Y'all know where to go. In fact, I you know I think there may even be a link down there. Uh, let's see, Brandy. What is it? Who received the names of the angels? It's a very good question. It seems to be the trace seems to go way back. But again, you we're dealing with this whole construct of good evil, which if we can get out of the dualism, we might escape this matrix. Like, hey, everybody, forget the dualism, man. Join us in unity. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, everyone, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Um, fall is here. It's a beautiful day. I am prospering. My wife is prospering. We are prospering. We're prospering together. The soul tribe is prospering. And we thank our wonderful angelics and divine ones for the gifts and talents. That's all I got to say. All right, folks. Um, Mall Space Cakes, open your mind. Isn't that the truth? I uh, love it. I uh, love it. I love it. Uh, all right. Much love to all of you. Thank you, moderators. It is, it's, it's this far out to come here each day. Someone said, wrote, made the comment, you make too many videos. And I said, you're just jealous. <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyway, uh, Doug, you're welcome. Hey there, Big Al. All right, folks, I'll see you there later. Make sure to hit the like button on the way out of the door. All right. I don't take an offering, but just hit the like button.